Good evening. Welcome to the Institute for the Transformation of Sport Spring Lecture Series, Critical Interrogations of Race, Gender, and Sport. We'd like to take this moment to offer our gratitude and thanks to the College of Education and the Office of Inclusion and Internationalization for their support of the Institute and the Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotion. Please take time to visit our college's website to witness and support the great work of this office. In the spring of 2022, the Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotion established the Institute for the Transformation of Sport as an extension of the department led by the George and Betty Blanda Endowed Professor of Sport Leadership. The department is excited to introduce the Institute to you with our inaugural spring lecture series, Critical Interrogations of Race, Gender, and Sport. The mission of the Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotions Institute for the Transformation of Sport is to amplify issues of social justice within sports and sport industries through research, community engagement, and strategic partnerships. And without further delay, we would like to introduce our distinguished lecturers, Dr. Billy Hawkins and Dr. Ajane Keaton. Dr. Hawkins is a professor at the University of Houston in the Health and Human Performance Department. His teaching and research contributions are in the areas of sociology of sport and cultural studies, sport management, and sport for development. He has published in several peer-reviewed journals and presented to learned societies in the areas of sports studies, including sport management, sport history, and sport sociology. He is the author of several books, including The New Plantation, Black Athletes, College Sports, and Predominantly White NCA Institutions, and co-author of Sport, Race, Activism, and Social Change, The Impact of Dr. Harry Edwards' Scholarship and Service, The Athletic Experience at Historically Black Colleges and Universities, Past, Present, and, per and Persistent, and Critical Race Theory, Black Athletic Sporting Experiences in the United States. He is a North American Society of Sociology of Sport Research Fellow. He received his PhD from the University of Iowa in Health and Sports Studies, a Master of Science degree in Exercise and Sports Science from the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse, and a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from Weber International University. Dr. Ajane A.J. Keaton studies how race and gender inequity shapes organizational structures, norms, and experiences. Keaton's scholarship is interdisciplinary as her examination of sport phenomena intersects with management, higher education, and sociological communities. As an interdisciplinary scholar, she has published in the following peer-reviewed academic outlets, the Journal of Negro of Education, the Journal of Issues in Intercollegiate Athletics, and the Journal of Sport Management, to name a few. Her academic work is informed by the theoretical prescriptions of Black feminism, institutional theory, and critical theory. I would like to encourage our audience to enter the Q&A portal with any questions that you may have for Drs. Hawkins and Keaton. After a few short words from our moderator, Dr. Marta Mack, the next voice you will hear is Dr. Billy Hawkins, who will lead us in the conversations on a revolutionary theory for social activism in sport. Okay, once again, welcome everyone. Um, I am uh, Dr. Marta Mack. I am a lecturer of sport leadership in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotion, and also the acting director of the Institute for the Transformation of Sport. So welcome. I would like to thank Drs. Keaton, and Dr. Hawkins for accepting the call and being our very first inaugural lectures in this series. We're really excited to hear what it is that you have to share with us. Um, one of the things that I wanna alert to the, the audience again is as you listen to each of the panelists, if you have questions, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A forum. And um, we will um, have students that will read your questions so that Dr. Hawkins and also Dr. Keaton can um, answer your questions. Okay, so without further delay, we will hear from Dr. Hawkins, um, who will go ahead and share his screen now.
Hello, and thank you, Dr. Marta Mack. Thank you, Dr. Flowers, for this opportunity to share with you all on this occasion. I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity and hopefully can live up to the, the standards that you're expecting. I want to talk a little bit about this notion of using critical race theory as a revolutionary theory it may not necessarily be a timely topic in terms of the political movement across different nations, but I think it's still valuable in some of the things that we do as scholars and sort of analyzing, not only analyzing, but and, and sort of, you know, creating um, programmatic um, opportunities for um, our athletes, not only at the collegiate level, but at the professional level as well. What I want to talk about is looking at the NFL as a case study and examine how activism um, can be a proactive means uh, to foster social change and movement, uh, definitely around the areas of social justice um, in, in various forms, um, and more specifically racial justice. I think it's important when we think about critical race theory, it is a tool um, to not only be analytical, but I also see it as a revolutionary theory, especially in terms of looking at um, how it has been created, and I think it's definitely um, one of the areas that we can use um, in terms of not only dismantling, you know, historical conventions of racism, but definitely, you know, current issues of white nationalism and white supremacy. So I definitely think that, you know, when we talk about um, deconstructing dominant narratives, deconstructing or exposing prevalence of racism in various social institutions, um, critical race theory is, is very much a, a tool to do that. You know, one of the things I want to do is talk specifically in in terms of one of the, the tenets of um, critical race theory and interest convergence. I think uh, I'm just trying to use, attempting to use it as a means of challenging sort of the dominant narrative around the apolitical black body and uh, an apolitical belief about, um, you know, blacks and sport in general and, and athlete, blacks and sport specifically, but athletes in general, uh, around this notion of being apolitical bodies, right? Um, so there is this, um, you know, obviously, you've heard this, 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 this statement about, you know, that you just shut up and play ball. So I think, you know, those protagonists needs that that sort of discussion belief need to be challenged. And to do that, you know, looking at interest convergence as a proactive and not necessarily a reactive theory, um, in promoting positive change. And so finally, to speak to the needs of racial justice in sport and sporting events as a means of striving for racial justice and emphasizing racial injustice. So it's sort of twofold in terms of, you know, highlighting, you know, historical patterns that have persisted and existed, as well as trying to challenge those uh, patterns of behavior. I want to talk a minute about some of the uh, historical examples I'm not going to do much of justice. I think um, there's you know, scholars, Joseph, Dr. Joseph Cooper has uh, written a, a great book on athletic activism. Um, I think it is, um, you know, covers uh, and creates this typology or shows this typology of activism. But I do want to touch on some, you know, high level or visible efforts that have been made when we talk about athlete activism. Definitely, uh, you may not necessarily consider Jack Johnson as an activist, but I, I often consider him as an activist, maybe not necessarily for racial justice, but definitely in terms of um, being able to self-actualize self himself as a Black man during that time in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, obviously, the conventions for Black male were very restricted and limited, and he defied those by some of the behaviors and not necessarily behaviors that we want to emulate, but I think the fact that he um, stood for what he wanted to be and who he wanted to represent is a form of activism. We all know, you've probably heard about Paul Robeson, a, a perfect example of his not only national efforts, but also international efforts in fighting Western imperialism. I think he was um, extremely vocal up until the time of his death um, and speaking out against Western imperialism and as in general and definitely racism within this country. 
Jesse Owens, you know, um, was, you know, um, I, I think in some cases have been viewed in questionable light as an activist. And I think in terms of his performance, you know, and again, Dr. Cooper talks about, you know, how some athletes, their, their performance is a form of activism and, I, and not necessarily, you know, those athletes may not necessarily, you know, um, uh, um, verbal in their forms of activism or speaking out like Paul Robeson, but definitely Jesse Owens, his performance performance is um, a, a perfect example of performative activism on, on the field in the 1936 Olympics. And, and most of you are aware of that. And need I say about Muhammad Ali, you know, and the, not only his persona, but his stance against um, Western imperialism, and definitely in terms of standing up uh, against, you know, some of the um, anti-war beliefs that um, are promoting the anti-war beliefs that was taking place during the 1960s. Per per perfect example of th this athletic activism. Um, and you know, the iconic, you know, this is probably the most visible form of athletic ac activism in terms of iconic images. Um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, uh, their stance and promotion. A lot of these, you know, according to the typology that Dr. Cooper talks about are considered, you know, symbolic forms of activism. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of, you know, how these can be converted into interest convergences, hope, hopefully one of the things that I hope to show um, during this, this presentation. You probably are familiar, or if I have heard of Wyoming, uh, Tyus, um, she was also a historical figure during the 1968 Olympics that get little press, believe it or not, but you can see here, um, she was um, wore blue shorts and I think it, you can see her teammate was wearing white shorts. So that was her way of um, um, verbalizing or, or, or visualizing her protest, um, not necessarily verbalizing, but visualizing it um, um, as she performed as well as, and again, she was a medal winner, um, but oftentimes it's overlooked because of the um, Tommy Carlos. To bring things up to date, uh, probably the, one of the modern athletes, when you talk about um, um, activism, athlete activism, you have to think of Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, and his stance as a Muslim, and not only as a Muslim, but against racial adjust, injustice and oppression um, throughout the world. Um, and he was one of the first athletes in terms of making a demonstration during the national anthem. The, the one phase he used to sit down during the national anthem, then they encouraged him to stand, and then he prayed, you know, um, in his Muslim stance. Um, doing the, the national anthem. And these are some other ones. I don't want to go through all of them, but these are some different forms of protest. And uh, normally when we think of protest, we, 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 we think of much more verbal content that's associated with it. But I think the visual efforts, the, the visual statements, uh, the visual content that's uh, provided is just as powerful when we see athletes, especially when you talk about the visibility and the publicity of athletes, um, not only nationally, but globally. And these are some of the efforts that we've seen athletes make um, throughout. Uh, another example here is the WNBA um, taking a, a, a knee. I think this is one of the um, you know, efforts that we've seen, especially when we talk about the, the take a knee movement. And these are some other ones that are sort of Within, uh, you know, some of the non-traditional or non, you know, publicized, you know, obviously professional athletes have considerable amount of exposure. Collegiate athletes, um, I, I didn't see many in, in terms of collegiate athletes and, and collectively taking a, a knee, but there are other efforts here when we talk about Howard University, Kennesaw University, um, uh, and, and others that have taken a knee to to, to show their solidarity. And these recent, most recent ones, Gwen Berry is a perfect example where she turns away. This is during the US trials, Olympic trials. She turns away during the playing of the national anthem. And you probably are familiar with during the, um, the recent Olympics, uh, Raven Saunders and her protests, right? The thing that I think is important to think about in all of these different cases and to try to summarize, um, none of them have had as much impact or movement 
okay they, they've had some uh, you know a lot of verbal content a lot of attacks obviously but i think the colin kaepernick take a knee has had the most movement in terms of market disruption all right. And that I think is the, the when we talk about protests and talking about this sort of theoretical, you know, implications of that and interest converges, you know, we're talking about, you know, material determinism and how protests can disrupt markets. Right. We saw it with the, the in Indian salt protests and uh, with Mahatma Gandhi, definitely you see it with Rosa Parks and the, the bus Montgomery bus boycott. Um, these are perfect examples of how protests can disrupt markets, okay? And that should be the end result if we're talking about using protests. Yeah, it's good to in, talk in terms of um, bringing attention to uh, racial injustices, but the end result should be some type of movement, whether it is providing some type of, uh, you know, additional program fund resources um, or charges in some cases against those perpetrators of um, racial injustices. So I, one of the things I look at when I talk about and still looking at, you know, sort of the, uh, the, 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 um, what has resulted. Now, this is what's taking place. Some of you followed this, um, these occurrences where a lot of disgruntled fans, they protested against the protests, right? By burning, um, you know, different memorabilia, burning season tickets, not showing up to games. Um, and I think this is an example of how a protest could, you know, sort of disrupt markets and be advantageous in terms of achieving um, desired outcomes. Because if you remember, interest convergence is that, you know, when we talk about white dominant power structure, they're not going to move unless there is something, there's some type of um, disruption to their, their, you know, ability to accumulate capital. OK, um, that's one example there. I think this was another movement um, that, I, I, you know, I, I took part in myself, you know, where I didn't watch the NFL for a couple years. OK, the Alabama pastors, you know, they united and called a boycott. And I know of other individuals that just refused to watch the NFL during the time um, Colin Kaepernick was um, demonstrating his um, his, his disgruntledness with the NFL. And these are some of the results of what happened with the market disruption and how interest convergence, if used properly, could be sort of this revolutionary theory in order to, and a proactive theory in terms of creating change and disrupting markets. Papa John's blames the NFL anthem protest, they call it the anthem protest, for taking a multi-million dollar slice out of the pizza earnings. You know, that's going to frustrate all right, many um, um, Papa John owners, okay, operators of the two largest U.S. ticket marketplaces say they're, they are seeing declines in orders of NFL games amid festering con controversy during the national anthem. And you can see some of the ratings that have fall, have, you know, it, that failed during this time of this um, take a knee protest. And I think these are examples of how a movement or how a, a form of activism, athletic activism can impact the bottom line and create or generate sort of movement among those individuals in positions of power or this entrance convergence. So then this technique movement uh, to wrap things up, uh, when you talk about um, end results, obviously the NFL had to take note. OK, there, there are a lot of movements that have taken place, um, like I said, throughout history where yeah, we brought it, it, it brought attention to a certain social condition, but it necessarily didn't um, move the needle in, in certain ways. And this case with the take a knee movement um, and we're still looking at whether this was, you know, obviously um, bringing um, Colin Kaepernick back into the league would have been the optimal right um idea or the optimate optimal type of outcome but you know they were able to or, or they they gave 250 um million dollars for over a 10-year period and i think there are some areas that are, are still receiving this type of um you know whether it's 
sensitivity training for police officers, de-escalating training for police officers. Um, not enough, not enough places as we just recently saw here recently. Um, cultural competency and proficiency training for police. I think, uh, again, two, $250 million is only a drop in the bucket for when we talk about police forces throughout the, the country. OK, uh, I think they were targeting the cities that they were housed in, that made that the NFL was housed in. All right. But it is something right. It is uh, an effort that on a part of the NFL. Um, so the, the thing that I, I will conclude with is that it was a social movement that disrupted, you know, market, um, you know, um, disrupted the market, but it wasn't prolonged enough to make significant changes. Okay, similar to the Montgomery bus boycott, um, it, it was long enough, sustained long enough to create um, some positive outcomes. Okay, um, the NFL brand is in the is um, in its concurrent current configuration is um, sort of at this point where you know too big to fail. Okay, um, it, it, under you know certain you know pressures, I think that there is um, opportunity to um, foster change. Not not only with NFL. NFL is only one one organization. I think you know definitely we have to look much more broadly in terms of um, other institutions and how activism in general and athletic activism could be used much more strategic in bringing about um, sustainable changes and changes that um, impact, you know, the, 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 you know, sort of when we talk about deconstructing and um, alleviating racial injustices, uh, okay, in, in various institutions. Athletes using their visibility as a means of activism must become more diplomatic and employing a broader base of support beyond their social media followers. I think there is, um, movements more much more movements internationally when you talk about um athlete um diplomacy you know using a a athletes not only you know having these symbolic forms of um activism but much more using their athletic um presence power right and when you talk about their visibility in a form of diplomacy where they're impacting not only racism that take place in their in their respective um, institutions, whether it's in hiring other black coaches, for example, or hiring black administrators, um, they have to have a diplomatic process um, in order to do that. So carrying activism to another level, okay? And, and not only um, within their own respective venues, but also in terms of the cities they're located in and the states they're located in, I think they can bring some, some greater attention to it, um, to the, those areas. So um, that's all I have for to, to generate a conversation and hopefully um, Dr. Keaton could, um, oops, I'm sorry. Let me stop the sharing. I'll turn it over to her. Hello, hello. I'm getting my screen set up here. All right, hopefully everyone can see that okay. Are we good, Marta? Professor Washington, Mac Washington? Yes, we're good. We can see. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, thank you, Professor Hawkins. I believe it's a great segue for me to build upon um, and expand. What I'm going to talk today is really going to be centering the Black uh, female athlete, the Black woman athlete. Um, the title of my lecture is Sport as a Means for Understanding Intersectionality. And I don't want to start this off being braggadocious, but in order to make sense of the case examples that I am going to be centering today, um, I want to tell a little bit about my own story. And so I grew up uh, playing competitive sport, particularly softball, travel softball, travel basketball and soccer, all at the same time. Um, and through my sport participation experiences, uh, in certain sports, I was hyper visible, and in other sports, I felt invisible. And I learned about my own racial and gender identity through my sport participation. And so I want to focus on two early childhood examples, particularly uh, softball and basketball. And so um, softball made sure I knew I was a little Black girl and brought attention to just how hyper visible I was 
um, because my coach changed my name. Um, as y'all learned today, my name is Ajene, uh, pronounced Ajene. It's not too hard. Um, but it was too difficult to yell, apparently, in the context of softball amongst girls with names like Sarah, Carly, and Sam. And so at the age of seven, my name was changed to AJ. Um, it is a nickname I continue to go by, but that internalization of my name, what my name means, is this too ghetto? Um, is it too Black? Does it not belong in this sport? I learned that very early. And so that internalization has stuck with me. Um, some of y'all here today might be thinking, but I call you AJ and, and that's fine. It's a name I've, I've grown to take ownership of, but just keep in mind, it's a name that um, my family did not give me. It's a name that I learned again through these uh, sport participations of being hyper visible and, and too different uh, in comparison to the other girls that played. But with basketball, my first love, I'm a former um, college athlete. I was now Ajene amongst Rachelles and Camilas and Kikis and Dominiques. And so I transitioned from being hyper visible to feeling as if I was home. Uh, but similar to my experiences in soccer and um, softball, basketball still reinforced that I was a black girl. And this was through parents. This was through coaches that would say things like, quote, we better not lose to those white girls. Why you let those white girls beat you along the baseline? And so these messages really did communicate to me that you have a racial and gender identity that is centered in this sport and is centered in your experience. And so I share these stories to demonstrate how this once little black girl learned about my race, or race and gender identity and to highlight that sport is not ism proof. That sport reflects many of the isms um, that we as sports sociologists seem, uh, seek to bring attention to. Classism, sexism, racism, but also xenophobia and homophobia and many other forms of marginalization. Through my storytelling, you can see how I came to navigate the cultural, social, and political aspects of my identity as a Black girl. Today, what I wanna do in this lecture is illuminate for y'all how Black women athletes, the best of us, top tier athletes, are marred by the politics of their identities as some of the best athletes in the world. I'm gonna share several case examples, three, um, that really highlight the politics of Black womanhood and uh, teach us and transition us to critical praxis rather than grappling. Uh, I think we've all heard this term since the summer of 2020, where well, we're grappling with race, we're grappling with these problems. Let's let go of grappling and transition to critical praxis, which is making the epistemologies of intersectionality real and putting it into our policy and leadership decisions. Intersectionality is a methodology, a uh, framework and theory for us to consider the simultaneity of identity and power and how systems of marginalization interconnect to create lived realities. Many of y'all may have heard of intersectionality, but its buzzword status has limited and stalled its utility to really understand Black women's social, cultural, and political plight. According to Collins and Blige, intersectionality investigates how intersecting power relations influence social relations across diverse societies, as well as individual experiences in everyday life. As an analytical tool, intersectionality is a way of understanding and explaining uh, complexity in the world and in people and in human experiences. Evelyn Higginbotham states, for black and white women, gendered identity, was reconstructed and represented in very different, indeed antagonistic, racialized contexts. In this lecture, we will all come to see and understand how the racialized context, racial hierarchy, and racial stratification exam in our society has resulted in the experience of femininity, femininity and womanhood being understood, treated, and experienced disparately in some of the lived experiences we know about Black women athletes. So today I'm gonna to start with the GOAT for our first case here. Serena Williams dominated tennis. We're all very much so aware of that, but I really wanna highlight that she dominated a sport that really didn't want to accept her. She was too aggressive, too combative, too strong, too vocal, for all intents and purposes, too black for tennis, particularly women's tennis. But despite these perceptions of the GOAT, she was insanely successful on and off the tennis court. She retired with 23 grand slams, the most by any man or woman during the modern era of open tennis. 
In my community, in my circles, we call this being built different. But despite Serena being built different, her wealth, athletic status, and proximity to whiteness, as her husband is a very, very wealthy white man, did not mitigate Williams from the reality of Black women's maternal health and hostile experiences we have delivering in hospital settings. In 2022, the CDC reported that Black women are three times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related cause up to a year postpartum in comparison to white women, 71% more likely to perish from cervical cancer, and 243% more likely to die from pregnancy or childbirth related causes compared to white women. Let that data sink in and, and register with y'all for a second. Olympia's, uh, excuse me, William's daughter Olympia arrived via a cesarean surgery. I too have had a cesarean and it is major abdominal surgery. And upon uh, Serena recovering from this surgery, she had to become her own doctor. We're talking about the GOAT with class, status, access. She had to become her own doctor. And for those of us who are familiar with her athletic career, we know she has a history of blood clots. And so with my Gray's Anatomy expertise, I would be in this room with Serena Williams being attentive to these blood clots. This was not the case. She states, in my haze, I wonder if I should ask someone about my drip. I'm at high risk for blood clots. I asked a nurse, when do I start my heparin drip? Shouldn't I be on that now? The nurses responded, well, we really don't know if that's what you need to be on right now. Again, this is the GOAT, access, class, not getting the treatment in the hospital that she deserves. She recounts, no one was really listening to what I was saying. The medical staff was not attentive to her needs, which resulted in her bursting her C-section wound. She begins to wonder if she's dying as she's recounting this experience in an interview. She's literally on the precipice of experiencing the fate of the data I just shared with y'all and that you see on the screen of Black women. She then has an embolism and a blood clot in her artery. Um, she is then again coughing uncontrollably. She asks the nurse. Um, the nurse then states, I think all this medicine is making you talk crazy. The nurse finally gives in. Doctor comes in. The doctor reports to Serena that she is, in fact, experiencing a blood clot in her lungs, and they barely save her life, one decision away from dying. As previously mentioned, the buzzword status of intersectionality has minimized its actual purpose, which is to be attentive to social systems and power. Many of us look at Williams as a Black female athlete who has all the power. She has the class status that puts her in her own category alone. But her class status did not mitigate the racialized context of our societies and systems. As it pertains to women's maternal health, the data clearly demonstrates the intersection of race and gender. The prominence, prominence and embeddedness of racial stratification and its intersection with gender did not enable her class status to give her the medical care that she needed from the jump. Hence, intersectionality in this case demonstrates the power of certain social systems, and we shouldn't use intersectionality to understand which identities can outshine the other. Rather, we need to understand intersectionality as an analytical tool to make sense of why for Black women our class status does not have the same power as race and gender in the systems entangled with race and gender. In this case, we see that intersectionality is not just acknowledging that we all have varying identities. That's really basic. Intersectionality teaches us that our racialized society has a racializing effect upon gender and class that disenfranchises us and challenges us to reimagine how we understand power. I wanna talk about hair. My second case example is uh, the Black women swimmers and the politic of hair in the Tokyo Olympics. Many of us have probably said something, but it's just hair. And as lighthearted or, um, you know, meaning no, no evil intent, I'm not, I'm not judging anybody, but if you said this, you probably did not uh, recognize that for Black women, it's not just hair. Hair is a representation of self. Hair is a political act. Hair is an act of resistance. Hair demonstrates wealth, creativity, and status. And for some Black women, it is a determinant of social mobility in the workplace. 
Thus, there is a politic to hair that cannot be ignored for Black women, and it matters. Black women swimmers in the Tokyo Olympics were not allowed to protect their hair by wearing swim caps uh, created by Soul Cap. Now, Soul Cap is a company that started in 2017, and they have sold about 30,000 of these swim caps meant to protect textured hair, Afro hair, big hair. The Independent reported that the Soul Cap is a top 10 best swimming um, cap to wear while engaging in that activity. And swimming by no means is overrepresented with women of color or by women who have textured hair. So the fact that it is a top 10 brand means that women with non-textured hair more than likely purchase and use this cap. Uh, during the Tokyo Olympics, the UK had its first ever women of color, and that's of any color, uh, represent the country in the Olympics. That swimmer was sponsored by Soul Cap. But according to FINA, which is the Swimming Federation, the swim caps did not, and I quote, did not fit the natural form of the head. And to the best of their knowledge, the athletes competing at the international events never used, neither required caps of such a size and configuration. So this means that Afro hair, textured hair, big hair was entirely disregarded, deemed as unnecessary and ignored. If we're keeping it a buck, which for those of a different generation, that means if we're keeping it real, uh, there are not enough Black women or swimmers with big textured hair in the Olympic swimming competition for FINA to ban soul caps. For a handful to benefit the majority, non-Afro or non-textured hair. Consequently, swimming caps designed to promote inclusivity and to encourage Black women to swim were ruled out for the sake of tradition, and policies that never considered the intersection of identity, particularly the identity of who is swimming and how does the who need to be considered in the creation of policy. During the Olympics, I was not surprised by this decision because I personally know and have experienced that, you know, Black women, we are fighting for hair dignity and respect in the workplace. And this is through legislation. Some of y'all may be familiar. Uh, Respect the Crown Act, which stands for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. The Respect the Crown Act was signed into law in 2019, first in California and currently in 18 other states. Kentucky is not one of these states. A Black woman is 80% more likely to change her natural hair to meet work to meet social uh, norms and expectations at work. And we see other data there to the left of the screen. In the US, in many states, we are currently not afforded race-based protection and we experience discrimination. This means career ascension, hostile experiences, having to explain, again, what is innate to who you are in your cultural group. Now, let me remind you that Black women swimming in the Olympics are at work. This is not a hobby. Thus, we see the politic here. Such a politic of identity is why Black women and women with textured hair have to continue to uh, advance the Respect the Crown Act. In this case, we see how sport leaders and decision makers perpetuate inequity through policy creation and policy maintenance that only considers the single axis reality of identity. FINA leaders' failure to understand the consequences of policy that does not consider the intersection of race, gender, and culture led to marginalizing and disparate impacts for Black women and textured hair swimmers at the Tokyo Olympics. Their decision had little to do with how these swim caps created an advantage for Black women swimmers and more to do with their ignorance as to why these swimmers would need a different cap, a different type of swim cap to begin with. Remember, intersectionality should address power and oppression that occurs from the interconnectedness of marginalizing systems. The power here is evident in non-Black and non-textured hair people having their needs not othered and not having their needs become a controversy. Again, while at work, while performing. FINA officials had the opportunity to put intersectionality into critical praxis. 
And this means drawing upon intersectionality epistemologies to empower marginalized groups, which is what the Respect the Crown Act does. This case also demonstrates that it is perfectly okay, and I highly encourage it, um, that we implement policy and make organizational decisions that deal with the marginalizing effects upon a particular sect of a group. Let me repeat that again, a particular sect of a group. This is because the intersections of power and marginalization manifest different realities. If critical praxis or empowerment through applying intersectionality epistemologies is the goal, then only considering the reality of a single axis group, in this case, women swimmers, truly only pays attention to the dominant group. And we've seen this time and time again in our history. I could even point to Title IX and, and throw some Title IX examples in there. And so when we don't consider those that live um, on the margins, we're continuing to uplift those who have access and who already have opportunity. White women and non-textured hair, the majority, remind Black women that this is not their sport, making their both and marker hyper-visible and yet invisible again. My last case example is dealing with BG, Brittany Griner, and the intersections of being a Black queer American woman. I want to specifically center Brittany Griner, um, just given the just how relevant her experience is, um, but particularly how I saw the intersections of who she is play out live on Twitter the day um, the prisoner exchange with Russia, uh, Russia, excuse me, um, was made public on December eighth. And so I remember the day that BG was actually de detained earlier in two thousand and twenty two. And I immediately began to reflect on why she was in Russia to begin with. Uh, for those of us that are familiar with women's basketball, it is because of pay inequity in women's sports. And then as I began to think about that, I transitioned to thinking, well, how is she experiencing her detainment given the intersections of who she is, a black queer American woman wrongfully detained in Russia? I then wondered how would the polity respond to her detainment and the response was through a gaze that saw, and let me repeat, that saw and not understood the intersections of who she is. The polity saw the intersections of who she is as a Black queer woman, but positioned her and those intersection, intersections as unworthy of saving, negotiating, and advocating for. If you sat on Twitter like I did on December 8th, 2022, and followed the hashtags and tweets related to her release, then you also received an education already on how Black women athletes um, really make real what intersectionality is through their lived experiences in and outside of sport. And so what I learned that afternoon, because I was following it all day, was that her dissenters and those who state themselves as being anti-woke or anti-CRT um, do actually consider the intersection of identity whether they admit to it or not, for fear of being more woke than they appear to be. I'm currently leading a research project with uh, Professor Ever Evan Frederick, my doctoral student, Keisha Branch, and Professor Ann uh, Pagaro, and we're examining over 80,000 tweets regarding BG's release with an attentiveness to the intersection of race, gender, and sexual orientation. And while I will only share a snippet of the data, a telling aspect is that BG in the eyes of her dissenters is not worthy of womanhood or worthy to call herself an American. And it is evident that these aspects of her identity are colored by her blackness and queerness. And this is why we must refrain from understanding intersectionality at a basic level of, well, you just have to take all these different identities in. No, we're not doing that. Uh, intersectionality is about the sense-making and lived reality that is created based upon the power of certain identities, but also how an identity is in relation with a particular socio-political context. BG's release should remind us of what Higginbotham stated in 1992, which was essentially uh, that gender identity is reconstructed by racializing contexts. In this regard, the intersection of our identity can also be colored by the socio-political context. Her release occurred on the backdrop of 321 state and federal LGBT, LGBTQIA plus bills that disregard the humanity of this community. 
Her release is also occurring on the backdrop of disgruntled and growing anti-woke agendas, um, whatever this actually really means. But the irony is that users who fit this bill or you know, would put themselves in that category is that they actually do see and discuss the intersection of who she is. So I'm gonna show a tweet, a tweet here um, and I'll give y'all a second to just review it and take in how, again, the intersections are present. And we can, again, see this remark, it's coming off this soci uh, sociopolitical context of um, trans legislation and um, transphobic uh, logics in our society, which when this user says, who doesn't even know which bathroom to use? Um, and I have some other vile tweets. I just wanna warn some of y'all as I click them on the screen. And I'll pause for a second. And as you read, again, uh, the intersections and the unworthiness, you, you, because of the intersection of Blackness and queerness, you are unworthy of womanhood, you are unworthy of the femininity, and uh, you are unworthy to call yourself an American. In this case, through BG's release, we learn that the intersection of our identity can be interpreted as valid reasons for denying us access to our full personhood or the advantages that presumably reside in another aspect of our identity. What I mean is, is her blackness and queerness was interpreted as valid enough reasons to deny her um, and to see her as the political prisoner that she was. She was not American enough for a large swath of our um, society. And so as I close, um, I just want to, again, highlight that the purpose of this lecture was to illuminate, and hopefully we all saw it and see it, the politic of identity for Black women athletes. Um, and although Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw, excuse me, coined the term intersectionality in 1989, uh, I want us to hold tightly that intersectional politics of race and gender have always existed for Black women. And were always discussed by Black feminist scholars and activists before Crenshaw seminal piece. And so as we transition today, um, hold tightly to intersectionality is much more than just acknowledging the identities that we hold. Intersectionality, again, is an analytical tool for making sense of the relationship and interconnectedness of identity that creates a particular lived reality for the individual but also creates a particular reality for how our identities are interpreted, as we see with the BG tweets. And so as we let go of grappling with issues of race and transition to critical praxis, we learn today that our failure to be attentive to the intersections of identity and how it is informed by social systems of marginalization can lead to dire consequences like death, in the case of Serena Williams, inadequate policy, in the case of Black women swimmers at the Tokyo Olympics, and can be used as justification as to why we are not worthy of uh, being advocated for in the case of Brittany Griner. Thank you. Okay. Goodness. I, I don't know where to begin. Um, this conversation, at least for me, is uh, very delicious, if you will. <clears throat> and so I'm just very excited to uh, get into it here with everyone. So I have our panelists go ahead and unmute their, uh, their video. And I'll ask you a few questions uh, first before as we get uh, a few more questions uh, flowing in from our audience. But um, uh, Dr. Hawkins, I'll, I'll start with you. First of all, to both of you, thank you. Awesome presentations. I really enjoyed them. Um, quite a bit, and y'all brought up a lot of um, uh, issues that um, I've been thinking about myself <laughs> um, in sport and trying to figure out like where do we go from here, um, and how th what are things that are going to look like, and how um, there are such dramatic shifts that are going on in society that have implications for how we do our work, um, how we prepare, you know, 21st century sport leaders, and those kinds of things. And so I think that your 
um, that your work and what you presented here today is kind of illustrative of um, the complexities of sport in many ways. You know, like a lot of people, when they hear the word sport, it kind of, you know, as the prefix, it kind of negates the thing that follows, right? So of course, if it's sport, then it's not history, right? You know, in, in those kinds of things, but, you know, one of the things in our uh, sociology and psychology of sport course that we live with, many of us use that Jay Copley uh, sport and social issues textbook sometimes in those, in those courses. And, um, you know, but a common um, reverb in our field is that sport is this uh, microcosm of the larger society, right? And, um, and that's one of the things that for me, why I chose for as a platform to kind of delve into and deal with some of these issues, because what I think that, you know, people outside of our field miss a lot of times is that, you know, there is a whole, there's a bubble <laughs> um, when we think about sport and like the things that are acceptable, you know, in sport are not acceptable in a larger society. And so, <laughs> and, and sometimes vice versa or, or, um, the issues that we see that uh, take place within the context of sport are, you know, are exacerbated, right? You know, when we think about people like Cassia Simia uh, uh, and some of the, the indignities that she's had to suffer, you know, learning about being intersexed on a world stage um, and even, you know, the, the, the uh, I'm sure the humiliating task of having to sit before a panel of doctors, right? To determine whether or not she was a, a girl, right? Or a woman. And so um, um, I think that, you know, what we do, you know, adds such great texture um, to the fields that we, we uh, intersect with. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, sports sociology, you know, culture studies of sport, uh, sport history, all of those different things. And so, um, I just really appreciate your work here today, you know, being really demonstrative of, of how um, important it is for us to do this work and for us to study it. Um, for uh, Dr. Hawkins, you, you know, one of the, the big conversations that are going on right now are um, name, image, and likeness in sport. And um, I, I was curious to know, I know you kind of uh, hinted towards this a little bit with professional athletes, but I'm curious about what you think how might we, as you know, academics in the field, um, as people who prepare um, future sport leaders, who have these athletes in our classes, who have access to athletic departments and those kinds of things, um, you know, what what kind of responsibility, you know, do we have to kind of help? these kids understand like the ones that may want to use their name image and likeness agreement, for example, to kind of effectuate change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things I'm thinking about is, um, um, oh, her name is escaping me right now. Um, the sister that's a swimmer, Simone. I just, I just lost. Simone Manuel? Manuel, yes, Simone mm -hmm. Manuel. And that she had a writer clause in her in her contract in one of the endorsement contracts that she um, she had she had a writer clause in there that made sure that you know that women of color would be represented in the commercials that you know that she was you know participating in or whatever um, thing that she endorsed that you know that women of color would be used in the ads and those kinds of things and so I I just want to get your thoughts about how you know, as, as an academic, how do we, we kind of intervene in this conversation and kind of help um, student athletes understand how they can use this name, image, and likeness, these agreements to, to leverage them for something more than just financial gain or something that might be just specific to their um, uh, respective teams. So I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, you on uh, mute, I think. Okay, I think there are several ways um, in terms of um, conscious raising uh, among the athletes that we have access to. Uh, a, a lot of times, if they're not getting in their homes or getting in in, in terms of um, their communities, they're entering environments, you know, athletic departments where they are trained to be conservative, trained to take orders, trained to submit to an authority. And, 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 and trained to be apolitical. And I say that very loosely because 
uh, uh, apolitical activity makes a political statement. So even though they have these, you know, sort of trained to be quiet or not to be expressive in their political opinions or trained to be apolitical, they're, they're making a political statement. So we have to make them aware of those um, opportunities, right, that they are being conditioned and socialized to be and to think a certain way and how to sort of challenge that without necessarily, you know, and, and, and talk about trying to take on the whole world, you know, even in their own individual spaces, I think it's important to think about ways of, of doing that. Um, so for me, it has been, you know, a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, because I've been at institutions where um, it is off limits to work collectively with athletes, mm -hmm. okay? Because, you know, they don't want to necessarily disrupt the market. Mm -hmm. um, so it has been a one-on-one -on -one, um, encouraging athletes to think critically about um, their position at, at the university, their visibility and how to use that. And I haven't um, dealt with any athletes in terms of NIL, you know, much more from an external lens and looking at Black representation and NIL contracts. But definitely I'm trying to promote, you know, athletes in terms of being um, conscious um, ab about the, the NIL affiliations. Okay, I know a lot of um, it's, it's, it's tempting, right, when you talk about um, getting NIH, NIL deals um, to, you know, support their family, you know, to support uh, a, a, a certain lifestyle they may want to have. So it's tempting to go after, you know, you know, the, the, the big op offers or the big opportunities that NF NIL collectives are offering, right? But I think even in that space, and I've know of some, you know, I've been reading about some athletes that have been proactive in terms because, you know, the NIL deals are real small. So they have contributed to certain foundations, some funds that are, you know, pro-Black in their efforts, pro-Black in their mission statement. So I think those are great opportunities. Um, and I'm hoping that on a larger scale, when we see athletes, you know, Black athletes specifically signing multi-billion dollars, multi-million dollar deals at the professional level that there is some conscious decision of making about um, how they are, who they're dealing with, number one, right? And it's similar to Simone Biles, having clauses to um, make sure that there's race consciousness and the activity that's surrounding them, whether it's in commercials, whether it's in leadership positions, whether it's in, you know, management, whatever the case may be. And I think those are some ways, but, you know, again, it starts at the collegiate level and fostering that again with the students we have. And if, if you have access to students at your respective universities, you know, use that opportunity as much as possible to um, raise consciousness, levels of consciousness, race consciousness more specifically. Yeah, um, and that, that makes me think about, you know, and we do have athletes that show up, athletes that show up in our classes and how important, you know, um, courses that emphasize justice, equity, uh, diversity, inclusiveness, you know, um, that those things are um, ex um, important conversations for us to have because it at least gets those students thinking about those things, but as well as these future sport leaders who are going to have to answer some of these questions as well. Um, because, you know, when I hear, you know, um, some of the students, you know, talk about the impact of NIL, and I think like just even the, the, in the past year, um, you know, you know how you used to have to sit out a year if you transferred to another school. And so mm -hmm. it's not that anymore. So they can just move around, you know. Right, and so right. when NIL jumped into that conversation, I was like, "Woo! I don't know what y'all going to do. And that's changing the kind of dynamic that, you know, coaches are having with their athletes. So, you know, it's things like that um, um, that I think that what we do in the classroom is going to be very important to um, helping people to think more expansively about, you know, what's going on now, because I don't see this kind of getting under control anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. one of the things I, I definitely see in terms of the transfer portal, as mm -hmm. well as um, new legislation, name, image, and likeness legislation, th these are, you know, emancipatory types of ag, economic oh, emancipation, absolutely. where, you know, you, you've given um, a certain degree of agency now, uh, and a greater degree of agency, and it's important that we educate um, our own specifically, but educate those that have that agency of how to use it and use it effectively. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Ed O'Bannon is like our very own Kurt Flood, right? Right. right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Keaton. So whew, I don't know where to start with yours uh, because I well, well here's what I don't know I how say. to feel about that, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, kind of, because I, I certainly was triggered by your your presentation, particularly with regard to um, hair. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking a lot about how, you know, when I was in high school, you know, I went to um, a, a very large school, but also a very, you know, famous high school. You know, I went to Eau Claire High School in, in Columbia, South Carolina, where Jermaine O'Neal, you know, left there to go in straight into the NBA. And both of our girls and boys basketball teams were nationally ranked at the time. And I just remember how much emphasis <clears throat> that we would get because of the kind of neighborhood that our, our um, high school was situated in. Um, that it was like this over in- emphasis on our, um, on our appearance, particularly for um, the girls, right? Um, and then, of course, I would see that um, in college, that was my first time having a woman as a head coach. And it was even more so, you know, um, emphasized in that way. And I just remember how people would kind of tease us that, you know, we would go in, you know, we play those double headers. We would go in the locker room after the game, get dressed, and we wouldn't even come back out until like <laughs> halftime of the boys game. Why? Because we're doing hair. Right. Mm-hmm. And we have to be very mindful of how we present ourselves or how we purport ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, once we went um, get back on the court. And then all of those things become, you know, intertwined with, you know, you know, different forms of identity, sexuality, you know, all of those things are being interpreted through the hair, particularly when I came through school, you know, like people were just starting to revisit natural hair when I graduated in, in 99 <clears throat> uh, back in the day. <laughs> um, but um uh, and I, I will say too, it, it made me think too about, you know, even how I wear my hair, you know, in class or, you know, in our profession, I, I cut all kinds of designs in my hair, you know, you know, and those kinds of things, but I try, I'm trying to normalize, you know, that is, you know, how we adorn our hair shouldn't matter, you know, um, and those kinds of things. And so I've worn my hair natural probably for the past 23 years, for sure. And then that's one of the things that I always get questions about, but it's certainly one of the things as a woman who wears natural hair where people want to touch my hair a lot, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I just think about how, you know, hair is just so much a part of how a woman athlete kind of perceives herself and perceives her, you know, her appearance, her beauty, you know, all of those different things. Um, I just think that it is, um, I, I don't know, I, really I think that's just an important thing to bring up, yeah. In women's basketball now, you know, um, when I played, my last year was 2015 at Colorado State University, and um, you know, I'm I'm ref at the high school level now here um, in Kentucky, and you know, I obviously still watch the game, and I'm seeing you know tapers and dreads and twists and locks and and like you said, natural hair at a level that would have was un- honestly unprecedented for when I was coming up through high school and early, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know. 2013, 2014, graduating mm-hmm. college in 2015. And so, um, yeah, I'm seeing it too. Um, there's this politic to hair. It, you know, I, I think at the Tokyo Olympics, it just became so surreal for me because I was like, there's not even enough Black women for y'all to be that concerned about this. And you still wouldn't let them wear, again, a swim cap that is top 10 in the game. So it wasn't like it was just this offbeat, you know, local brand, like this was a legitimate company. And so talk about being hyper visible yet invisible. Um, I just couldn't think of of a better case example for that. But also we see it with, um, as we're talking about NIL, um, I think about college athletics and the um, women's basketball athletes, particularly black female athletes, edge is done, lash is done, you know, it's, it's changed the game. And so when I'm thinking about NIL, I'm always like, which edge control company is going to reach out? (laughs) <laughs> to old girl from from LSU or, or really any anyone on the team who has who have their edges and swooped and it's laid and slayed and so you know that to me is a missed opportunity again on the margins where I see black female athletes stepping into that fold and uh, being their authentic selves representing the communities they come they come from but I'm not seeing the NIL um sponsorship or marketing or even athletic departments who are supposed to be handling these NIL deals 
thinking again about the intersections of that athlete mm -hmm. and not doing these generic oh, restaurants or mm -hmm. flag or tire shop. Um, and so, yeah, so even again, the, the intersection of the politic of culture, race, and gender, I think can be seen with the discussion of NIL. Yeah. I have a bunch of questions for y'all, but we're gonna take some from the, uh, from the audience. Um, and so uh, one of our students that are um, managing the uh, question and answer portal um, is going to uh, pose uh, both of you a question, um, a piece, and, and you can elaborate. I can start things off. Uh, this question is for Dr. Hawkins, and it is, uh, how has social media impacted these protests? Uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. I think um, unlike the historical acts of protests that, you know, there obviously they were um, not as widespread in terms of um, coverage and immediacy in terms of when we received it. A lot of those images were it, it was months before they got into the press. Nowadays, with social media, we have both an immediacy as well as uh, a, a greater, um, um, when we talk about coverage, you know, not only nationally, but internationally. So we have this, um, you know, sort of national exposure that is given to these images and it's done immediately, you know, so um, people are knowing what's going on, you know, even if it's just the image or just wearing a shirt, I can't breathe, people are able to connect that to, uh, you know, so, some some form of racial injustice, you know, much quicker than historically. So social media has played a critical role in advancing the message, okay, advancing those images that I think inform um, a broader audience of some of the things that's going on. And do we have another question for Dr. Uh, the Keaton? second question is to Dr. Keaton. Um, can autonomy for women be improved through increasing intersectionality? I'm sorry, can you rephrase it um, one more time just so I can understand the, the full breadth of the question? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, can autonomy for women be improved through increasing intersectionality? Autonomy. Um, well, I wish I, I I knew what the participant meant by autonomy. I'm I'm gonna kind of assume they mean ownership. Um, so maybe taking what I'm hearing in the question is like maybe taking ownership of who they are in the intersections of where they reside. Is that what I'm hearing? Is, is that what y'all getting from the question? I believe so. Okay. Um, I I think so. Um, this was again something I had to learn myself. Um, the autonomy to this is who I am as, as Ajane, as AJ, Professor Keaton, but this is how I also know how my identity is perceived. And so it's not just what I'm experiencing, it's maybe what I'm trying to mitigate and what I don't want to experience because of me being a Black woman, um, but particularly a Black woman in sport. And so, um, and this goes to, you know, in-game situations. This is how am I responding to the ref? How am I, what, what does my foul look like in comparison? Do I, do I get to, again, be boisterous and, and, and show that personality in a way because I know how Black womanhood is interpreted by others in our society? And so, yes, I do believe autonomy can be a strategy to take ownership of it, but um, that singular ownership doesn't mitigate the existence of these systems of marginalization, um, but it does... Um, help us understand how we're experiencing the marginalization because of the intersection. All right, the next question that comes from in, Magala. Uh, um, she says, phenomenal presentations. This is for Dr. Hawkins. Uh, beyond market uh, disruption, are there other domains of possibility for interest convergence to be a, a mechanism for the revolutionary transformation of sport reporting? I think uh, last word was sport reporting. Well, uh, sport and well, sport, 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 sport. Sporting. Yeah. I said the wrong word. 
Okay. I think now market disruption is the ultimate end of any type of protest. You know, again, going back to the salt mine um, protests, going back to the Montgomery bus boycott, um, th th that's the ultimate one. All right. So prior to that, now, there are mechanisms. Sport diplomacy is one. Sport activism diplomacy is one where um, athletes are able to express, uh, you know, if, if, if it's um, dealing with representation and leadership, for example, um, they're able to sit down and talk to the powers that be, whether it's athletic directors, presidents, in a diplomatic fashion, a united fashion, and address, okay, the, 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 their concerns. Now, um, if, if they're not necessarily heard or valued uh, for what they're requesting, I think then it comes to, you know, the, the forms of protests that disrupt the market, whether it's work stoppage or whether it's similar to what Colin Kaepernick, even though, as I said earlier, it's, it wasn't sustainable. You know, I think work stoppage is, is the ultimate form of market disruption that will bring about um, sizable changes, but up to market disruptions and using interest convergence, there are diplomatic ways, I think, uh, a collective voice from athletes could be used, whether at the professional level, collegiate level, or interscholastic level, for that matter, where there are racial injustices that are taking place. And I think, um, un unfortunately, <clears throat> There hasn't been that. Obviously, they're, they're, you know, Northwestern they tried to unionize and other different areas. They, there's, you know, obviously the players association with different um, players union with different um, leagues, baseball, football, and, and what have you. But I don't think they have necessarily focused collectively enough on a specific area. You know, say for example, when we talk about um, uh, black coaches in the NFL, that could that could end in a year. Right. In terms of increasing the number of black representation in head coach position, that, 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 that should be a problem, you know, in terms of a concerted diplomatic way of informing owners as well as management. This is what we want. Um, and again, these are the terms that we want to, you know, want you to, to consider. OK. If not, <laughs> these are the alternatives, right? So I think there are some, you know, up to the point of market disruption, up to the point of work stoppage, there are some, you know, much more diplomatic, political ways of handling um, racial injustices. I have another one to toss back at you, uh, Dr. Hawkins, and then I'll mm -hmm. come back to you, Dr. Keaton. Um, <clears throat> Um, I, I was thinking about the slide that you had with um, Wyoming uh, Atias in her protest. And, you know, I remember reading uh, the revolt of the, the black athlete in, mm -hmm. in high school. I mean, not high school, but in, uh, in my PhD program. And, you know, I, I think I remember seeing her name almost like in the final few pages of, of the book. And, but it did make me think about um, the role that gender plays in the ways in which um, uh, athletes have to do protests. And so, um, I guess my question for you is, you know, you know, would you suggest or would you say that, you know, we need to look at or define um, uh, uh, activism or athlete activism um, in different ways because they can look different for, um, you know, men and women in sport? Yeah, I, th I think having a, a broader definition because I think there are um, different needs that are, especially if if you were to look at the context of collegiate sport, for example, um, the the goal there and you know sort of the the end result there is to create a greater emancipatory structure with collegiate athletics, where athletes, you know, we have the name, image, and likeness, right? We have that opportunity and, you know, some athletes are benefiting from that. But I suggest adding an L, an additional L in terms mm -hmm. of labor, mm -hmm. okay? So that's that's going to benefit a certain segment, you know, more so than others. So obviously in revenue generating sports of, 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 of 
football and men's basketball. And in some, you know, programs, women's programs, it'll benefit them because if they're generating revenue, they should be able to capitalize off of their labor, right? And benefit from the works that they're, they're producing, the athletic talent that they're, they're rendering. So I think, um, yes, it's, it's going to look differently for different people when you talk about act, um, activism, but I think it's going to benefit all in terms of, you know, um, if, if it's um, distributed and or, or, or the intent is egalitarian, you know, where there is intent for all athletes to name image your likeness now even though you know um, one of the studies that i've recently done not many athletes are benefiting from it i know you hear about some how we're, we're talking about three percent mm-hmm. of athletes that have an opportunity to benefit so we're talking about a small percentage and um you know when you talk about those that are benefiting in significant ways like me multi-million dollar contracts You'll be surprised that you know the white women are benefiting much more, you know, rapidly, and 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 I'm seeing you know this whole notion of voyeurism, sexualization of the the body, the, the, the as a way of these women, you know, sort of um, capitalizing on it. Which, you know, I I don't have a problem with that third wave feminism. You know, this whole you know they as long as they have ownership over it and and able to. Um, uh, manage it in a way that is empowering. I, I think that is great. So, so then I think how we, you know, form our efforts of activism again will look differently for different people. Differently, definitely for um, black men opposed to black women. Okay, they they have they may have a different set of needs, right? Um, but again, if we're talking about emancipatory structures, um, if it starts with a certain group, right, we see it potentially benefiting um, other groups as well. But it has to be, you know, we, we have to have, you know, conscious enough individuals so that if they're pushing a certain agenda, it has to be inclusive of, you know, what's going on with Black women athletes on these campuses in terms of objectification or marginalization. And how can we include that in some of the activist efforts we are, you know, promoting? Yeah. Dr. Keaton, did you want to weigh in on that question too? Or you No, to- I just I'm just vigorously head nodding because I um it's I it's been fascinating to see it play out in real time because again this was something um you know many people have advocated for and I think for for some the advocacy at one point this was seen as almost the means to an end um in a way but it still it doesn't get at the structural issue here which the issue. Um, yes, NIL is great, but I, I think uh, my time of being a college athlete, it's a lot of work to develop a following. You know, my little sister plays at uh, North Carolina a t and they have 11 basketball page, her and her boyfriend, and, uh, you know, 20,000 to 70,000 followers, I think it's a big gap, but I think it's closer to 70. And the effort it takes to do that, to get NIL deals that aren't really guaranteed, and oftentimes aren't financial, you know, getting drinks, getting shoes, granola bars, gear. But uh, we, I, I hope we can, after these early years of NIL, stop seeing it as the um, the means to an end in the conversation around labor. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back to my presentation, thinking intersectionally about NIL and which sports and uh, the sexualization that is not on the athletes of those sports, but has become in, you know, the perception of those sports and how NIL is playing into them. Yeah, um, I'm gonna ask this question and then uh, I think the, the students have another question for you guys, but, um, uh, you know, Keaton, you know, we, we kind of go back and forth quite a bit about these things. So, you know, I'm gonna try not to get too meta on you here, but I'm, I'm really thinking about intersectionality and and the body and particularly the black body and and specifically black women's bodies um, in sport. And I think about how a couple of things. One thing I think about is um, like, you know, this liminality of of being a black woman athlete, right? You're, You're not, and you're not a woman because you're not white, right? And then you're not an athlete because you're not a man, right? 
Um, and then, and then of course you, you have like this hyper visibility and it's like, how do you, how do you exist in a space, um, that is constantly, um, devaluing your, uh, your humanity, um, and, and, and is advancing anti-black sexism, for example. Right. And, and, and I think professional sport and also to a, a great extent, intercollegiate sports as well, particularly NCAA sports, um, but I'm thinking more about like the professional, like when we look at collective bargaining agreements, you know, we know that athletes are described as labor and that the owners are described as owners. And Dr. Hawkins has a great book uh, that came out before uh, Million Dollar Slaves, long before that, long before that. Um, so I'm gonna always advocate over these journalists, but, um, um, but you know, no disrespect College of Communications for sure. But, um, but certainly I'm, I'm thinking about how um, when, I, when you think about high profile athletes that their bodies are for two things for, or they are for two things. They're for consumption, right? And then they're there for entertainment, right? And then when we, you know, when we think about that, particularly those of us who come from the diaspora and have a, um, um, a particular relationship with labor, um, and, and also the building of an economic structure in, in, in the Western world and those kinds of things. And so I just kind of want you to kind of speak to um, how you think that intersectionality is important for kind of elucidating Black women's humanity and, and kind of bringing those things more to the, fo to the fore. Yeah, so, oh man, there's a, there's a lot, a lot to work. Just pick something. I'm sorry. <laughs> My wheels keep turning. A lot, a lot to work with there, but I want to focus on um, Black women athletes who are um, not as visible. And mm -hmm. so we think about tennis, we think about swimming, um, thinking outside of basketball and track. Um, and a moment for me where we really see this dichotomy um, was on. Uh, we had Naomi Osaka and Serena Williams, and mm -hmm. we see colorism so clear. Mm -hmm. And so here people would say, well, they're both, you know, Black women um, and that intersection of race and gender. But I think the complexity that we can add to race and gender and the body and the politic and consumption and labor is the colorism aspect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something uh, in sport we haven't really touched I think, um, you know, in politics and cultural studies, you know, the work that in, in, in your space that you do, um, but in sport management, colorism has not, has not even scratched the surface. And I think it's because there's a complexity to colorism that we have to acknowledge changes the interpretation of the athlete. So Naomi Osaka, when playing a white female athlete, is the standard Black female athlete. Naomi, Naomi Osaka playing against Serena Williams her politic changes a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, it's no longer this, this blanket black womanhood. Now we're dealing, well, she's biracial or this Asian identity. And how do we make sense of that? And so um, that to me would be something that I would like to see sport management really process and dig at some more mm -hmm. because there's a historicity to there with that colorism mm -hmm. of um, being a little bit racially ambiguous mm -hmm. or um, not a darker skinned black woman. Like these are politics that black women were, were very much so accustomed to. And we know that that conversation has not happened in sport. Uh, we saw it with, um, her name's escaping me. It must've been Sylvia Fowles when, um, you know, Sue Bird mm -hmm. or it was either Sue Bird or Diana Taurasi. One of them were retiring. I think it was Sue Bird recently. And the tour for her was just out of this world, marketing, opportunity, conversation, media. And I believe if someone can put in the chat, I hope I'm not wrong. I believe it was Sylvia Fowles and it was crickets. And I went to go look at her resume and it was long. It was, it was just this story. It wasn't. And so I think um, our comfortability with the white black binary mm -hmm. with race in general or with race in race in general, particularly with white and black women, it's so clear for us. I want us to dig at the nuance found within colorism and uh, how we present racially and, and that, you know, that uh, narrative of mixed identity and, and what that means and how that shapes the politic, um, even though it's a black mixed uh, race identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how people, 
you know, even though we talk about you, you reference uh, Evelyn uh, Brooks Higginbotham, that meta language of race. I had to read that thing like a hundred times in grad school. Oh, that's such it. a good piece. Yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? But, you know, as she used to say, you know, just because we say race is a show, social construction doesn't mean that it, it doesn't have material effects in our lives, right? And so that, you know, you're getting at that piece of it, right? That, um, that when we consider race, we, we, we can't know it when we see it, you know what I mean? Um, and that is not always written on the body and you can't always tell. And there may be people, you know, I, I try as a practice now when I refer to even my, uh, my black students in my class, I say, do you identify as African-American, right? Because they may be a first generation, uh, you know, a first generation kid in the class that may still have their, uh, their uh, nation of origin as their ethnicity and but still see themselves as being black, right? So I think that, you know, you're right about how we have to um, certainly have more nuanced conversations around race, particularly for um, Black people who find themselves in America. And then, of course, the rule of hyper descent being in, in America's definition of race being kind of imposed on them um, by the, the larger society, right? Um, and kind of forcing them to kind of bend to the wheel of, you know, um, being seen as African-American and they may not want to be, you know. Um, I think that's important. I think we have another question coming in from the students. Okay, this um, question is from Aliyah McDaniel. I believe it's directed towards you, Dr. Keaton. Um, it says, for future sport leaders, specifically black and brown women, how can we show up authentically as ourselves and all of the intersections that come with it, whilst um, still trying to integrate into a white, male dominated society? That's a great question. And um, I commend you for um, bringing it up in the space. So thank you for that. Um, when I when I get that question, I immediately think of the socio-political context that we're in. And if we all can, um, you know, not for COVID reasons and not for the anti-Blackness that was so grotesque, but if we go back to the summer of 2020 and how sport organizations responded, um, it still it still shakes me to my core because everyone became a DEI champion all of a sudden. You got um, <laughs> Nick Saban doing uh, protest walks with Alabama football. You got athletic departments making statements, hosting rallies. And so I, when you pose that question of showing up authentically, I'm curious how these sport organizations are still in this space of we want these individuals, we want to appear as diverse, we, we, we need that before legitimacy purposes, um, and how that legitimacy and perceived legitimacy will shape your experiences. I think when you find yourself in organizations, only you will know that, but how Black women um, in my research and even in my own experiences, that negotiation of what we want to bring and how much of self. Um, although I'm just going to be honest, although sometimes we want to bring all of ourselves to an organization, you don't have to. Um, I think that is, you know, something as we get into the workplace, what do you want to keep sacred to you for your own protection, for your own wherewithal, um, again, for your own career ascension, that we, there are aspects of our identity where we'll find ourselves so hyper visible that the way we negotiate what we want to bring isn't out of their benefit, it's out of protection for us. And so I kind of want to flip that back that, you know, not having to be, um, I have to be 100% here, or I have to buy into my organization, I think is kind of a pushback and a protection mechanism that, um, you know, Black women do engage in because diversity and inclusion has become such a hot topic and how your identity can be used in the organization to benefit. Um, primarily white male dominated organizations. I have research on black women diversity leaders and this is something, you know, they're they're very keen to where they say, you know, they can't fire me, they can't let go of of the black woman uh because it's going to make their organization look bad. And so there's almost this power dynamic and this leverage that I'm seeing black women in my own experience and in um those that are that are leading DEI where it's like I think we have an advantage here because these sport organizations have put themselves on the chopping block to say they value diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. All right, then the next uh, question I have is for Earl Rafer. 
Uh, it says Dr. Harry Edwards is prominent for being the mastermind to the protest of the 1968 Mexico Olympics. Later, UC Berkeley professor and the social activist speak to the expansion of uh, sports sociology uh, curriculum influence across the nation and the world. I think, that, oh, I'm sorry. It was, it was directed towards uh, Dr. Hawkins. Okay, okay. I, okay. I, I didn't get the question aspect of that. Uh, it says, uh, speak, speak to the expansion of the sports sociology. Okay, okay. Of the, this nation and the world. Okay. I think obviously when you think about um, <clears throat> social activism, but definitely in the 60s, you, you can't, you know, dismiss or <laughs> miss out in mentioning Dr. Harry Edwards because obviously he was an architect of the, um, the Black Power Revolt. I, I think um, he, he has contributed significantly to the field of sports sociology, continues to, con you know, um, contribute to the field. I cont continue to see him as a mentor. Okay, so one I can lean on in terms of you know tough issues. Um, I think you know when you talk about um, sports sociology, there have he, he's probably the progenitor for a lot of black sports sociologists, right? And the, the work we're doing, so we look to him as sort of the model on um, how to you know use scholarship, right, in terms of. Um, Ad, advancing, you know, issues around social justice and, and, and having a social justice orientation, okay, because up until, you know, him coming on the scene, and especially in the area of um, sport, there were very few, uh, much more in broader areas, obviously, in politics and law, you know, but I think he is probably one of the forerunners in the, in the area in the context of sport. Right. So most of the sport, black sports sociologists I know, male and female, um, sort of, you know, could pay homage to um, Dr. Harry Edwards and, you know, sort of how he has contributed to the work we do, the lens we use. You know, I think one of the things that he has recently um, publishes the five ways of activism. And I think a lot of scholars are using that now mm -hmm. in terms of these different ways. And he's continued to adding to, the, to those waves. But he is still informing us on how to think critically about race in this context, right? And don't take it for granted that, yeah, we have billion dollar athletes now, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're free, right? Um, we, we still need to push for um, emancipation, right? Emancipation in terms of, you know, administrators in terms of owners ownership and definitely in terms of you know equitable um, uh, um, returns of the investment so yes I, I, he's he's a tremendous asset to the, the field of sports sociology yeah I would just like to add to um, I totally agree you know I shaded everything that you just said but also I think I would be remiss too that you know um, even before uh Dr. Edwards, you know, who certainly, you know, popularized um, um, sport as, you know, as, a, as a, the sociology of sport. But one of the first pieces, my students know I love the show books. So one of the first pieces was written by uh, CLR James, Beyond the Boundary. Um, and this is more from a, you know, uh, diasporic kind of pr perspective, but this was kind of seen as one of the first kind of sports sociological pieces um, written. And then, of course, I think that um, Dr. Harry Edwards also brought uh, what we could do with that into in sharp relief, I think, in many ways. Right. But CLR James, of course, was just, a, you know, just a great thinker um, in many ways. And uh, this Beyond a Boundary book is, is certainly um, um, one of those books that um, I try to return to to get kind of um, an understanding of, you know, the complexities of you know, enjoying um, sports that don't love you back, right? Um, <laughs> you know, and um, and um, I just think that you know that's one thing that I would put out as a suggestion to the to the audience who um, like to read in those areas. I think that that book is very accessible. Um, that talks of you know that kind of um, elucidates really some of the the challenges that a person of color can have, um, particularly diasporic peoples or co colonized peoples. Um, um, the kinds of experiences that you can have uh, participating in, in sport um, 
that uh, in sports that were given to you, uh, basically. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? Uh, we have one more question from uh, Jeremy Smith. I think it's directed to every to each panelist. Uh, it goes, what will sport transformation look like? Example, league strictly for trans and transgender students. I can I can start if y'all want me to. Okay, so I, one of the things that I, I would say is um, when I think about that question, one of the things that it reminded me of was um, um, Nina Simone's um, song Mississippi GD, right? And in that song, in the lyrics of that song, you know, um, she says that they keep telling you to go slow, but that's just a trouble, go slow, desegregation, go slow, mass participation, go slow, reunification, uh, do it slow. Uh, doing things gradually, go slow, brings more tragedy, go slow. And um, I think that one of the things that she's trying to convey in there is that we have to be active right? Um, that there isn't just one strategy that one should use to approach um, problems that, um, that face us that require that we transform them. Um, and I think that um, in part that we need to do a better job of bringing our LGBTQAI plus community to the table uh, to have this, these um, conversations and make sure that, that even that group in and of itself is very diverse, you know, in terms of socioeconomically, in terms of racially, because they are very different experiences in, in, that, in those categories because you know, no one group is, is monolithic. And um, I think one of the places that we have to start um, that you know, even that we're facing just at this very moment <laughs> um, is, is to push back when we see that there, there are challenges to policies and, you know, and those kinds of things um, that are trying to retract um, people's rights and those kinds of things, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why the Institute for the Transformation of Sport came into being is to kind of be this bridge between the academy and our communities because we need to have conversations to help people better understand using language that they can better understand, you know, what's at stake, you know, when we exclude people, you know. Um, so I just think that that is one of the things that um, um, is a place for us to start. Um, to kind of um, address that it is going to go slow, but I think that we still always have to have like, you know, you know, uh, what my mom used to call um, measure urgency, <laughs> you know, um, and be very calculated in the way that we do, because I think that many of the strategies that we've used in the past aren't very effective in, in this 21st century. You know what I mean? In terms of, you know, like, say, for instance, protests can't be the only way in which we bring about change. It's got to be protests. It's got to be people um, attacking um, policies and pushing back when people are trying to roll back, you know, rights or, you know, or even just the smallest thing is, you know, when you hear something, you know, in the hall, you know, that makes your ears burn to say something, especially if you occupy a position, a, a privileged position, right? Um, so you could be a minority and still occupy a privileged position if you, you know, identify as a cisgendered um, male, right? And so our man, and so, you know, I think it's, it's all of those things that we have to do um, in order kind of to kind of move things um, forward. But, you know, uh, we are far behind in that discussion for sure. Did I get it? Or y'all got something else to put in there? Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, if y'all have uh, uh, Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Uh, Keaton, we're going to wrap start wrapping up here. But if y'all have any questions of each other, you know, feel free to to do that, and then we'll we'll start to um, um, go into the end of our program here. Yeah, I'll throw um, one out to Professor Hawkins. Um, as we say in academia, he would be my academic grandfather uh, <laughs> for being the. The, the link that connects us. And so um, I'm curious, how do we make sense of the animosity for activism and racial justice and bringing attention, particularly to anti-Blackness, to that now being a part of DEI strategy um, and part of organizations, particularly sport organizations, corporate social responsibility? 
Because mm -hmm. I, I guess for me, I feel like people haven't fully acknowledged this pendulum swift um, shift that happened mm -hmm. that all of a sudden now this is all just DEI and, and everyone's just on board with this. And so if you could just speak to that a little bit, I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I think a uh, great, great question, Dr. Keaton. I think in terms of this, this is where we could be advocates for, for white people. You know, my, my belief is that it is the responsibility of white people to address racism and a lot of the racial injustices that take place and black people could, could, could help because um, there is still a great sense of fear. And I think a lot of the um, animosity is from a, a place of fear, right? Fear of losing ground or fear of, you know, uh, e even when you talk about um, the notion of disrupting white spaces, that's, and, and, and you know, if it, even if it's, you talk about professional sport, collegiate sport, we're still entering white spaces, right? And that creates a significant amount of fear. And, and I don't even think about entering those white spaces and you are looking different, like you're saying, with the hair or with, you know, you're, you're just your style, your mannerisms, you know, um, I think. So if, if there is a way that we can encourage white people, right, in, in their fight against racism to um, de dethrone their fear of losing um, something they don't have <laughs> that they think they have, right, um, it will be a start. Okay, I think it, it would be a start in getting rid of some of the animosity. Okay, and I think some of that animosity deals with, and this is a, a tough situation again, um, of the self hate that exists and is sort of disguised with this animosity. Um, and I know it's probably hard to think of why people don't hate self hate. You know, don't hate themselves. Well. In, in actuality, how they're responding and how the fear is being um, demonstrated in forms of animosity, I see it as a form of self-hate, right? Because anything that's not advancing the, the, um, the advancement of the human condition is a form of self-hate. And they may not necessarily see it in this fashion, but I think if we can get them to understand that this is an act of violence against themselves more so than an act of violence against us. And unfortunately, we are, you know, we are sort of um, re receiving it now, but in the long run, ultimately, it's, it's a disadvantage to them as well. So, and I, and you know, I, I'm, I'm talking in a black white issue, you know, but you know, this can happen in in any case. It can happen with white women and black women, or Asian women and white black women. You know, where, where, wherever there is this fear of losing something, losing identity, losing ground, losing economic status, uh, uh, political, whatever the case may be, um, diffusing that type of fear, I think will aid in sort of this, this, this notion of animosity that's sort of targeting these, these different areas of DEI across the nation. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, my, my question, I think I had several questions in terms of that, you know, around black women. Um, I, I work with a group of black women um, and one of the, the, the women, well, she was a scholar and she wrote a piece which never got published, um, um, Black Hair, Bad Health. And I think, um, and, and it brought uh, attention, this was, you know, in the, the 90s um, where, you know, obviously when you talk about the health condition, there was a, a lot of focus on black women's health and even more so now. But one of the things she was sort of highlighting is this idea that we don't necessarily take in consideration um, of how, you know, as you said, when we think of hair, black women's hair, it plays much more of a central role in their identity than, you know, many other cultures. So um, how do you think, um, how, what, what type of sort of adjustments in terms of um, that, that are health related, are they still sort of pervasive where black hair is adding to black health in any way that you see currently? I know there are tons of different ways that women are wearing their hair now and braids that allow them to participate. But I know you, you showed the, the issue of the swimming. So um, are there restrictions, you know, that black hair is continually playing in the role of black women physical uh, physicality or physical activity? 
That is a great question. Thank you. Um, I want to dive into that some more. Um, I think, you know, for me, when I, when I was thinking about this lecture and really how to bring attention to intersectionality and just to clear up um, how it's been used and, and honestly weaponized to say that, um, you know, certain people aren't being intersectional enough and that when we get at the, um, you know, even going from Crenshaw and again, those original activists and theorists and, and, and mothers and caretakers, they've always thought intersectionality, intersectionally about race and gender. And so when thinking about it in sport, I wouldn't say, you know, health complications, but the experience of hair itself and that decision on how to wear hair, given the sport that you're participating in definitely does matter still. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, for it to be causing adverse health conditions, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not too sure there. Um, but I know, you know, there's um, in my high school refing side career, you know, they just made it possible to wear certain beads. Um, there was actually a, a rule where if there were beads and attachments and, and really strict hair policies, particularly in Kentucky, um, for the high school athletic association. But this past year, I saw that loosen up. And so for, again, like that was to me an example of critical praxis of acknowledging that, hey, these hairstyles seem to be innate to this community. And by us telling them that they can't wear their hair this way, um, we could think of the black male example of the wrestler a few years ago that had to cut his dreads, uh -huh. um, which, you know, for, for those of us that do grow dreads, you know, it's very, very personal, very intimate, very spiritual for, for many Black people. And so to, he cut them in a, you know, couple of seconds or minutes decision to be able to participate in the match. And so, you know, this politic of hair, I think we can also see extend to Black men. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing when I talk about adverse health and her thesis is that um, it reduced women's physical activity, thus it increases their chances of ultimately, you know, mm -hmm. um, attracting these different types of health disparities. Okay, so. I and, wish that would have got public. That's fascinating. It is. That is it very is. interesting. So she, she looked at a population and even the group I, I was interviewing, I had about 20 women in this group, Black women, and we were looking at issues of intramuscular fat and its connection to diabetes. And mm -hmm. at least half of the women mentioned that they didn't participate in certain, you know, go to the gym or what have you, because, you know, they just spent a hundred and some dollars on their hair and they're not going to, you know, waste that, you know, and she was finding some of the similar things that when you talk about, uh, not only when you talk about college aged women, but she saw at the high school level, parents um, having their daughters opt out of physical activity because they didn't want to mess up their hair. I have yep. seen that. I've experienced it. So I don't, I, I believe the findings. I've, yes. I've made that decisions myself a couple of times. I just right. got a fresh press. Is it really <laughs> worth it right now to go ahead and sweat this out? So I believe you. I wish that I would have gotten, um, you know, available somewhere for us to read. Yeah. 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 yeah no, I, to I totally agree with that. And um, uh, we're going to start to um, make some shifts here, but I, I did want to just really highlight um, what you're the, the importance of what you're saying about intersectionality, um, particularly um, that this was this was a a a theory or an idea or a way of seeing and knowing that was trying to specifically you know um, explain you know, the unique, that, that liminality that I'm talking about of how black women experience themselves, you know, um, taking up space, but not occupying it. You know what I mean? And I think that um, intersectionality, you, you did an excellent job of demonstrating of how intersectionality helps to, to show the persistence of racism, you know, cause like the point you were making about Serena Williams the same thing applies when we look at the, disp uh, the disproportionate um, impact that COVID had on the African-American community. If you control for race, class, gender, um, access to insurance, we still um, scored lower than every single racial group in the United States. And so that shows that part of that problem are, is, is very systemic, it's institutionalized, right? Um, and that, um, that, you know, we really have to look at this, this idea or concept of racism in the, um, 
uh, in the, the medical fields. And you know, we all teach students that come out of uh, um, health and human performance. You know, we have, um, uh, you know, future exercise physiologists, uh, folks in health promotion and stuff in our area. And I recently gave a talk in one of our colleagues' classes about that very thing with um, Serena Williams. And again, I like to show books. So those of you, you know, you should look at, check out Harriet Washington's uh, medical apartheid, uh, Dr. Michaela Bethune uh, from uh, Leola, uh, Los Angeles came in and, and snuck in with us with their, their, who turned me on to this book many years ago. And um, it, I, I told that I wanted to encourage them to really read that book because even though it's talking about the experiences of Black Americans from uh, the colonial period to the present, you know, it can help them to really understand that, you know, it's not just muscles, ligaments, and bones entering into your courses, but there are whole people who, and like you said, it's a historicity, right? There's a specificity to the kind of historical orientations that African Americans bring with them into um, an office, right? Um, and I had my own personal experience with having a pulmonary um, embolism myself this uh, this past summer when I got back from Spain, <clears throat> and I, I knew what I had, you know, because I, I I recognized those those symptoms, and I had to wait probably about maybe about ten hours before I got the dye for them to identify that I was right. And then of course, to get the blood thinners. And then I was kicked out of there, you know, 14 hours later, you know, didn't even stay overnight, you know, without medication, right? So again, you know, it's, it's those kinds of things that, you know, your, your class or your um, education can't protect you from. And so I just really appreciate you kind of showing how um, we have to also look at black women in sport outside their experiences outside of sport, right? Um, and then sport helps us kind of kind of bridge the two together. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, say I'm appreciative for that. And then also Dr. Hawkins, very appreciative for this conversational athlete activism. You know, lots of people have been asking us about that. And so um, when I thought about it, I was like, I know the perfect person to call in for this, uh, for this panel. So, you know, we thank you so much um, for that. And so with that said, we just want to uh, thank very quickly um, some of the sponsors of our event. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Keaton. Um, we would also like to give a special thanks to the University of Kentucky College of Education and the Office of Inclusion and Internationalization, Department of Kinesiology and Health Promotion faculty and staff. Um, thank you for supporting the Institute's vision for the future sports in the 21st century. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my uh, KHP 688 event management and managing sport events course. Um, they have been awesome in taking up some of the uh, programs in the, uh, the, the, the lecture series, um, did an excellent job, I think, um, making sure that everybody had a good experience. And so these are all of the students that were involved in that and their respective um, committees. And then also a very special thank you to uh, Dr. Rashid Flowers um, for helping me to kind of mentor the students through um, putting these events on. Um, and so what we can all look forward to, we have another um, event coming up. <clears throat> we are doing a, uh, a filming of um, a screening and discussion of um, LFG um, that will discuss um, the women's, uh, US women's soccer team and their struggle to um, get pay equity um, in sport and those kinds of things. So we hope that you will all come back out for those um, and support our students. This is their event. I'm, I'm, I'm chilling out on this one um, and just kind of hanging back and, and seeing what they can do with that. But we know that they're going to do a great job um, uh, moving forward. And so um, with that, again, thank you both for you, um, you all and thank everyone who um, came to sign on to the, uh, to the, to the event. You know, it was very well um, attended here and many of you hung on until the end. And so we thank you. All right. All right, everybody have a good night and get home safely. <laughs> thank you all. Thank Dr. Ma Marty Mack, Dr. Flowers. Appreciate y'all. Thank you for having us. It was, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right, everybody get home safe and have a great one. <laughs>